Hello and welcome to The Corporate Casket, a bi-weekly series where bad businesses go to die. We discuss anything and everything from bad charities, terrible CEOs, and businesses that have a lot to hide. And today we are following up on another gigantic video game publisher, Activision. I know there's a lot to get into when discussing this company, so let's just cut to the chase and dive right in. Activision is one of the largest video game companies in the world behind Tencent and Nintendo. Their revenue can reach around $1.7 billion per quarter and at least several billion per year. It looks like they took a bit of a hit in 2019, 6.5 billion as opposed to 7.5 billion in 2018. But I mean, that's still billions of dollars. They're doing just fine. However, Activision wasn't always this huge, obviously. Our story of how the company was founded starts with David Crane in 1977, when he joined Atari at that time. The company was maturing from a feisty Silicon Valley startup to a mass market entertainment company. Nolan Bushnell had recently sold to Warner, but he was still around offering creative guidance. Most of the drug culture was a thing of the past and the days of hot tubbing in the office were over, Crane recalled. The sale to Warner Communications had given Atari the much needed financial stability required to push into the home market with its new VCS console. Despite an uncertain start, the VCS soon became a retail sensation, bringing in hundreds of millions in profits for Atari. It was a great place to work because we were creating cutting edge home video games and helping define a new industry, Crane remembered. But it wasn't all roses as the California culture of creativity was being pushed out in favor of traditional corporate structure, Crane noted. Bushnell clashed with Warner Board of Directors and in 1978, he was forced out of the company that he had founded. To replace Bushnell, Warner installed former Burlington executive Ray Kassar as the company's new CEO, a man who had little in common with the creative programmers at Atari. In spite of Warner's management, Atari was still doing well financially and middle management made promises of profit sharing and other bonuses. Eventually, things began to fall apart. Job satisfaction reached a low point and while game designs were invaluable, the pay was abysmal. Crane said that games he'd been 100% responsible for generated $20 billion of revenue and he was working for about $20,000 salaries. But Crane wasn't alone. Alan Miller, Larry Kaplan, and Bob Whitehead were also dissatisfied. Between the four of them, they were responsible for 60% of Atari's $100 million in cartridge sales for a single year. So the gang of four, as they became known, left Atari. Atari soon realized their error in letting prime talent walk out the door. However, their first response was to try and sue the fledgling company out of existence, accusing them of copyright and patent infringement in a 1980 lawsuit. Atari bought full page magazine ads to try and paint us as criminals when all we were doing was pursuing our chosen craft, Crane remembered. Atari's lawyers would continue to dog Activision over the next two years before their complaint was finally thrown out. Activision's first games, Dragster, Boxing, Fishing Derby, and Checkers were on shelves by the 80s. The vibrant boxes left strong impressions. And as Crane put it, we were our most demanding critics. In 1982, they released Pitfall, one of their biggest hits. And within just a few years, they reached revenues of a million dollars per employee. $60 $60 million, 60 employees, an absolutely insane profit. They were booming. Though they faced some challenges along the way, which we will touch on in a bit, all in all, they climbed up pretty high, pretty fast. And does this sound familiar? Because this reminds me a lot of the gigantic multi-billion businesses I've covered. They don't all start out shady, but as underdogs, people can root for. People that care about the quality that's put out there. They work incredibly hard and push themselves to succeed. Then once the dream is realized or the original creators step aside, all the importance of paying video game designers, all that passion, it takes a backseat to profit. Activision was the first ever third-party developer of video game cartridges. They opened up an entirely new business and they made video game history. I will absolutely give them credit for that, but I think that's what makes it so disheartening to see how far they'd fallen from grace. In order to explain when they went downhill and when Activision changed, we have to briefly get into structural changes at the company. I'm not gonna go too deep into this, so think of this as like the Cliff Notes version of their changes. First, we've heard about their success, right? They were seemingly on a path to consistent wealth without a care in the world. Activision built up a name for itself in almost no time at all. However, by the mid 80s, three out of the original four, Kaplan, Miller, and Whitehead all left. 
even their founding CEO, Jim Levy, resigned. Activision had dealt with the video game crashes okay, but of their recent acquisitions and ventures, they were low on funds and therefore low on morale. Stock plummeted, Miller and Whitehead jumped ship to form Accolade. We own stock, but the VCs got the controlling interest. Whitehead explained to Digital Press Online, we were insiders, so selling stock was a no-no, but the market had turned and our stock was a 10th of what it was and morale wasn't good. In the late 80s and early 90s, Accolade would pick up much where Activision left off in its original mission, including its fight the system attitude towards console development. Two years later, CEO Jim Levy offered to buy out the struggling text adventure developer Infocom, noting the similarity in culture and mission between the two companies. The two companies quickly came to an agreement and Levy promised to leave Infocom more or less alone to do its thing. Six months later, in response to further losses, Activision founder Jim Levy was kicked off the board and replaced with Bruce Davis, the one board member who had opposed the Infocom merger. In 1989, after 12 quarters of loss, Infocom was shut down. About half its employees were offered jobs within Activision. Five agreed, the rest stayed in Massachusetts out of disgust. This guy Davis apparently wasn't too great to work with since the last of the original four, Crane, left because of him. When the board put Bruce Davis in charge of Activision, it was a death blow. I tried to work with him, but found that he had no creative or marketing skills. His only prior job was to run Imagic out of business, bringing it in for a landing, as it is said. The Activision that I had a hand in creating was gone, so I left, Crane said. Crane continued to work for a time as an independent developer, creating games for Activision, and then joined Gary Kitchen to form Absolute Entertainment in 1988. At least we know whatever the hell happened to Activision from this point on, we can't really blame it on the founders. They saw what happened to their company and fled. It's a shame to see company trade hands like this and get passed around, but when it's something the gang of four works so hard on and you know, then it just gets thrown out, it just, it sucks. But hey, at the very least, they weren't responsible for what was to come. A couple years after Crane left in 1988, Activision changed its name to Mediagenic, but they were posting losses. Robert Kotkick bought the company and Crane himself said it was good for the name and assets, obviously not because of the current state of the place. They became Activision again and Bobby Kotick promised investors that they'd make money again, that they'd be as successful as they were in the early days. When Activision's fortunes seemed darkest, Kotick was looking for a business to buy. Activision fit the bill. It had 60 million in debt, a library of once popular cartridge action games, Nintendo and Sega licenses, and the Zork and Planetfall franchises. Its stock had dropped so low, the company could be had for a mere $2 million. The 28-year-old Kotick and his three partners seized the opportunity. First, they fired all 200 employees and implemented a bankruptcy organization plan. Then they exploited two surprising findings. Activision's superb distribution network and its powerful but unused proprietary authoring and compression tool. They gave distributors a vested interest in the company by issuing stock to fulfill past debts. Activision now sells directly to 80% of US retailers and began using the authoring tool to create a sequel to Activision's greatest franchise, Zork. The return of Zork was a breakthrough CD-ROM, full motion video, terrific music and sound effects, a Hollywood cast, and a loyal following. Zork on a brick would sell 100,000 copies, says Kotick. Return to Zork sold more than 1 million by the end of 1994. Kotick and crew also mined Activision's arcade library, creating reworked Windows 95 Action Parks, which sold more than 200,000 copies, and a remake of Pitfall, which topped 1 million units. These successes helped fulfill one of Kotick's two promises to investors, four years of 50% annual sales growth with near break-even profits, the second promise is much more ambitious, create several big budget, first-rate titles each year starting in 1995, leading to solid profitability by 1997. I know this is just speculation here, but I feel like they never left that mindset. It's been over 20 years, and throughout the years, their goals have continually seemed more aligned with making money than the original care about designers or passion for gamers that got them their good name in the first place. I'm not saying profits aren't important. Obviously, this is a business. But by multiple accounts, Kotick really places a priority on money. He seemingly hates socializing. He reportedly skipped his own birthday party, unless it's to turn partygoers into investors. He has, as Forbes puts it, never picked up a joystick and doesn't personally even like video games. And any hesitancy he has about merging with World of Warcraft went away when he started seeing dollar signs. In China, where rampant copying has eaten away at the profits of any Western media company trying to enter the market, customers at 160,000 internet cafes spent $150 million last year on Warcraft time by the minute, protecting the revenue from easy piracy. 
Kotick's reluctance began to fade. What if he could sell Activision's other games to China the way Blizzard did, putting Guitar Hero into all those internet cafes and charging by the minute? The more Kotick learned about the power of the Warcraft franchise, the more enchanted he became. Activision's board officially signed off on the merger in 2007, and the deal creating Activision Blizzard closed the following July. Kotick was left with control of 2% of the combined company stock, shares now worth $135 million. Again, he's a CEO. I get that earning a company money and keeping it afloat is literally his job, and I'm not gonna knock that. But after reading this Forbes article, I just, maybe I just can't fully put my finger on it, but something just doesn't seem like passionate or, or alive about this company about wanting to do something cool with Activision. It was just pump this bitch with remakes and, you know, live off the fanfare. And then, oh, is Warcraft a thing that's doing well? Well, we'll, you know, pump money into that shit too. It just, I get it, but I also just don't. I just want to note that because it's really clear that that mindset without a doubt has been reflected in this company and the way it operates. One of the companies that get a ton of backlash is Activision Blizzard. When Activision merged with Vivendi Games and took ownership of this Blizzard brand name, that's when fans started to take note and grow disappointed with the quality of things to say the least. One user commented on a Blizzard forum that, we went from dark, creepy, insane games like Diablo and Diablo 2 with superb music and Brood War became professional competition in Korean to a tournament with disconnects and players who switched to classic mode so they can try to play. Look super amateurish and non-professional, but we're talking about a billionaire company. You don't have the resource to at least fix the disc bug and just get a little credibility. Similar to EA, we're seeing what was once a game maker become a game killer or at the very least, a subsidiary ruiner, you could say. In 2010, not long after Activision took the reins, Blizzard announced that they had plans to put World of Warcraft users' real names on their posts. CVG said, it seems like Blizzard's looking to turn Battle.net into more of a social network than a competitive matchmaking service. As it says itself, it's important for us to create a new and different kind of online gaming environment. One that's highly social and which provides an ideal place for gamers to form long lasting, meaningful relationships. All of our design decisions surrounding Real ID, including these forum changes, have been made with this goal in mind. Our colleagues at PC Gamer UK call the plans foolhardy and asking for trouble. The gamers that live and breathe their service at every level from the bottom to the super hardcore pro gamers simply don't identify themselves by their real name when they play, the mag says. They live by their identity or handle. Battle.net isn't a social network, it's a fight club. According to Blizzard's announcement, all StarCraft II and Cataclysm forums will display your real name. That means even the tech support forums and the role-playing forums. I'm not sure why I need to identify myself when I'm trying to figure out why Warcraft crashes or when I'm pretending to be a druid. One angry reader said of the plans, I don't want all of the world to know my real name. More social it might be, but it's very intrusive to my privacy. In this day and age, when most social websites are being pushed for more privacy functions, they decide to open it up in one of the worst possible ways. This isn't a gigantic deal when compared to other things we've seen, but it's absolutely frustrating. And this is also where a lot of Blizzard's issues began. I can definitely see why it would upset people though. The whole point of these games is to be something you're not. During a session of D&D, it's not about social media. It's about being immersed in who your character is that you've created. Facebook isn't attached to them for a reason, but because the higher ups at these companies are so focused on money, it feels like they tried to turn it into a social network because hey, Facebook and Twitter make money, so let's have our forums make money too. But the gamers in these communities were frustrated, pissed off, and very rightfully so. Seriously, did Blizzard even consult with anyone who plays WoW before making this announcement? Not to mention, there's the issue of privacy. One Blizzard employee posted his real name on the forum saying that there was no risk to users. First of all, while risk is a gigantic part of the issue, it's also about trying to turn your forum into something it wasn't intended for the purpose of making money. But secondly, the experiment went drastically wrong. Within five minutes, users got a hold of his telephone number, home address, photographs of him, and a ton of other information. What was that he said about no risk? Giving out your name wasn't a big deal? Like, yeah, that's, that's what you were going with? In October 29, Blitzchung announced his support for the Hong Kong protesters in a live stream. Blitzchung is a professional esports player that lives in Hong Kong. He's one of the top players in that region for the game Hearthstone, which by the way, free Hong Kong, as NPR states, Blitzchung wore a gas mask and dark goggles during that interview last Sunday, evoking the gear activists have worn during months of street protests. 
Toward the end of the segment, he shouted the popular protest chant, Liberate Hong Kong, Revolution of Our Times. He didn't shout, fuck you, China, or Blizzard should support the revolution, or let's riot and tear down the establishment, right? He wasn't inciting violence, cursing, or speaking about Blizzard at all. People talk about which way is the right way to protest or to advocate for a cause, but I don't see anything wrong with what he did. Unfortunately, Blizzard did not seem to think the same way. Blizzard Entertainment said the player's statement violated a tournament rule that prohibits any act that brings you into public disrepute, offends a portion or group of the public, or otherwise damages Blizzard's image. Blitzchung, a Hong Kong native who started playing Hearthstone in 2015, was banned from participating in Blizzard Esports for a year. He told several media outlets that his tournament winnings, said to be $10,000, have been rescinded. Blizzard also announced they will no longer work with the two Taiwanese streamers who interviewed the esports player on Twitch. After his punishment was announced, Blitzchung spoke to his fans on his personal Twitch account. Today, I lost Hearthstone, but it's only a matter of four years, he said, referring to his years playing the game. But if Hong Kong lost, it's a matter of a lifetime. The gaming community has largely denounced Blizzard's actions, accusing the California company of caving into China. Some of them also note that Tencent Holdings Limited, a Chinese conglomerate, owns a 5% stake in Blizzard's parent company. They work with Tencent, so that's not a good look. But banning him and withholding his prize money? Mm, I remember hearing about this when it happened, and it makes me just as pissed off now as it did back then. Clearly, this wasn't about the message, just losing that 5% stake. Plus, taking away his rightful winnings for that? It's not as if it was a couple hundred dollars, according to the Wall Street Journal. He lost $7,000 and the chance at a $200,000 prize the next season. Funny enough, because of this, their shares were down 2% the Tuesday after this happened. And if you ask me, they should have allowed free speech and even supported the message. Maybe they lose the 5% from that parent company, but the respect and share price wouldn't have taken the hit that it did. Plus, you know, it's just the right thing to do. And it's time to pay some bills and thank today's sponsor, HelloFresh. HelloFresh gets you fresh pre-measured ingredients and mouthwatering seasonal recipes delivered right to your door. It lets you skip the trips to the grocery store and makes home cooking fun, easy, and affordable. And that's why it's America's number one meal kit. HelloFresh offers 25 recipes or more every single week, featuring a range of flavors, cuisines, and ingredients, so you'll never get bored. And eating healthier has never been easier with low-cal, carb-smart, vegetarian, and pescatarian options every week as well. So no matter what you choose, every single recipe is packed with fresh produce sourced directly from farmers. And HelloFresh is also offering Easy Eats, which is tons of quick and easy meal solutions that are like 10 to 20 minute meals. It's for those super quick meal nights when you just don't wanna get out all the pots and pans to do some cooking. Like I ordered some pesto caprese sandwiches and I am so excited to receive those cause I love anything with mozzarella cheese. So if you wanna get started today with HelloFresh, go to hellofresh.com slash casket12 and use code casket12 for 12 free meals, including free shipping. Again, go to hellofresh.com slash casket12 and use code casket12 for 12 free meals, including free shipping. Thank you so much, HelloFresh, for sponsoring today's corporate casket. So let's take a look at some of their legal disputes because there haven't been many at least not after 2008 or when Activision owned the company. So I guess I can give them that. Plus quite a few of the ones I see listed are involving copyright, private servers, you get the picture. Not much that Activision or Activision Blizzard did maliciously. So at least there's that upside, I guess. Now I can't get through every single legal battle they've ever been involved with, but I'm going to try and touch on the highlights and those that I think really reflect the company's character. One of these was in 2003, when Activision faced a class action lawsuit for not being honest about the company's revenue, you know, to deceive investors. Activision strongly denied this and said revenues weren't overstated. Simple enough. This happened over 15 years ago, so why care now? Well, because recently they've been accused of doing the exact same thing. Kuznicki Law says that people purchasing shares in the company between August 2018 and January 2019 were misled regarding Activision Blizzard's decision to part ways with Destiny developer Bungie. As a result, they say, Activision Blizzard's public statements were materially false and misleading at all relevant times. Shareholders who want to be represented by the firm have until March 19th, 2019 to submit their information. 
Activision Blizzard announced their split from Bungie in January, revealing in an earnings call that the decision stemmed from Destiny 2's failure to meet revenue expectations. The split is reported to have cost Bungie $164 million. But despite that windfall, Activision stock dropped a significant margin in the wake of the announcement. PC Games published this article in March, 2019, but PR Newswire also published one in February, 2019, stating that Rosen Law Firm was actually announcing the class action lawsuit. So it looks like both law firms have filed against them for this one. Guess you know it's a nasty situation when it's multiple law firms teaming up against Activision, and it really makes me wonder if something else is going on there. Obviously, this case is not over with, but I'm curious to see how it turns out. In another case I wanted to briefly touch on, this one has to do with Worlds Incorporated. They had specific patents that relate to methods in creating a 3D graphical multi-user interactive virtual world system. This whole situation was really bizarre. And from what I understand of it, Worlds Inc. was just suing Activision and Bungie, one of the studios they worked with for being an MMORPG. It doesn't look like they stole anything specific. Worlds Inc. basically wants to own everything that has to do with the style of video games. To this day, they're still in patent stages and the IPRs are being reviewed. So it's just a strange case that could go horribly for Activision if it moves forward once again. But to be fair, if Activision loses this one, then this would set a precedent that wouldn't really stop Worlds Inc. from going ahead and doing this to literally any other company that uses this type of format. So am I rooting for Activision on this one? Possibly. However, the biggest lawsuit it seems like Activision is known for is their lawsuit with the creators of Call of Duty. The two men who co-created the multi-billion dollar Call of Duty franchise filed a lawsuit against their former employer, the company that publishes the games, Activision Blizzard. Activision then countersued in court with claims totaling over $2 billion. David Green from NPR stated, this was going to be the biggest lawsuit in the history of the video game industry. The trial was all set to begin today in Los Angeles, but at the very last minute, the battle over Call of Duty ended with an armistice, a settlement. And for more, we've reached LA Times reporter, Ben Fritz, who's been covering all the twists and turns in this case. Ben Fritz gives a pretty good summary of the situation, so I'm going to use some of his words here rather than try to go over each piece of every single minute in detail. What happened was in March, 2010, Jason West and Vince Zampella, who had co-created the Call of Duty games, made billions of dollars for Activision, were fired and this shocked the industry. And within a few days of their being shown the door, they filed a lawsuit against Activision and claimed the company had fired them because it wanted to get out of paying them hundreds of millions of dollars in royalties and bonuses that they were owed under their contract. The company Activision said that they had breached their contracts, that they were sick of working under the heel of them and they wanted to decamp to Activision's biggest rival, Electronic Arts, and steal Activision's intellectual property in the process. And that would have been a breach of their contract. There was a lot of crazy stuff that came out in the court documents. There's a lot of fighting going on internally. There were literally people hanging up the phones on each other, changing locks, like it was insanity. Activision felt they had no idea what was going on with Jason and Vince and their development studio. So they asked somebody in their IT department to try and break into the computers to read their emails and check their voicemails. And when it turned out that it was technically impossible, Activision actually considered staging a fake fire drill or fumigation so they could be able to get into the offices and find out what was going on with Jason and Vince. There's a broader issue according to the developers and their supporters, and they had a lot of supporters in the industry. And it's a question of the level of respect and power that game developers, the people who actually create the games have. So yeah, this is a little bit worse than what I thought it was going to be. Staging a fucking fire drill to break into someone else's emails, just lovely. Call of Duty creators and Activision settled for an undisclosed amount, but holy shit, I really, really hope these people put them through the ringer. That is insane amounts of bullshit. And Fritz is right, honestly. Not only does it come down to a matter of the illegal shady activities, but there's no respect there for the creators either. Developers deserve respect. Anyone that works for you deserves respect. And now we'll go on to that part that a lot of people hate about EA as much as they do Activision, the studio killing with some mistreatment mixed in. I won't say that every single studio Activision ever acquired died because of them. Sometimes indie game studios just go under whether or not a larger company like Activision gets involved. However, there's been quite a few cases that are pretty obviously Activision's fault and the way they treat people leaves a lot to be desired. So let's get into it. Activision Blizzard lays off 775 people after record results in 2018. Not the best headline to start with. 
Game publisher Activision Blizzard will lay off 8% of its workforce or around 775 people, CEO Bobby Kotick announced on the company's earnings call today. This move is being made in an effort to deprioritize initiatives that are not meeting expectations and reducing certain non-development and administrative related costs across the business. In the future, Kotick said Activision Blizzard will invest primarily in live services, Battle.net, and esports with a focus on the following franchises, Candy Crush, Call of Duty, Overwatch, Warcraft, Diablo, and Hearthstone. For those franchises, Activision actually expects to increase, not reduce, development resources in 2019. The changes follow a series of executive departures at Blizzard, as well as reports that Activision leadership has become more involved at Blizzard, which previously operated more independently. Blizzard did not release a new game in 2018, apart from expansions and remasters, and is not expected to in 2019, according to an earnings call. However, the company operates several internal studios that are working on multiple live games. Job listings suggest development on Diablo 4 is continuing as well as a yet announced first person shooter project. Activision is entitled to move in whatever direction they want, absolutely. And if that means Candy Crush, Call of Duty, Warcraft, that's their choice. But the way these layoffs came is real shady. According to Games Industry, some of the layoffs were an open secret at the company for months, and not all staff even knew that their position was about to disappear. An article from The Divergentist states that one standout developer shuttered by Activision is Bizarre Creations. The successful Project Gotham Racing and Geometry Wars series are the handiwork of this studio. After being gobbled up by Activision in its 19th year of business and putting out Geometry Wars 2, Blizzard was enlisted to develop a new driving game that played like a mashup of Mario Kart and Project Gotham, the latter of which could not be further milked by Activision as it was not acquired from Microsoft along with the acquisition of the developer. Thus, Blur was born, but struggled to differentiate itself from the myriad arcade racing games that were flooding the market at the time. After Blur saw only middling sales, Activision relegated Blizzard to developing for the James Bond franchise, ultimately leading to its demise. Next Gen Tactics made a video in 2011 saying how Activision laid off 500 people that year, and that sounds pretty damn familiar to last year, because they were taking on people, gobbling up the little ones, and then dissolving them. He gives the examples of DJ Hero, Guitar Hero, True Crime Hong Kong, and these aren't small games. They justified it as wanting to allocate their funds on bigger projects, as we saw earlier, because they're putting their money into their cash cows. Their attitude, as he puts it, is blockbuster or bust. In a 2012 Games Radar article, they state that Activision shut down a ton of studios under their umbrella within a small window of time, such as Sierra Entertainment, which was around 29 years old before Activision ownership but it closed after less than a year when it merged with Activision. Shaba Games was active for five years before Activision owned it. Then after seven years at Activision, it closed. However, according to Games Radar, much of those games were just a string of Tony Hawk's games before the licensed fodder started calling. Budcat Creations was founded in 2000 by two ex-EA employees and specialed in porting games to non-target consoles. After a raft of work for EA and Majesco, the studio was bought by Activision in 2008 and put on the PS2 and Wii ports of Guitar Hero. Unsurprisingly, given the team's focus, it was closed in 2010. The seventh studio closed on this list is appropriately named Seven Studios. Fairly inevitable case, this one. Seven Studios had long been a purveyor of licensed TV and film games, working on the likes of Charlie's Angels, Pirates of the Caribbean, Napoleon Dynamite, and Shrek. Given that it had also been developing the ill-fated Scratch the Ultimate DJ, Activision put it into its music division as a support team for DJ Hero. And then when the little games division went under, Seven Studios was obvious fodder for the chopping block. There's also Radical Entertainment, which was around for 17 years before Activision closed it in four. Blizzard Creations around for 19 before Activision closed it in three. Red Octane for another that closed this year, you name it. They closed a lot of studios, just like EA has done. For a lot of people, Blizzard was that company someone loved before, and then it became Activision Blizzard. And as for further mistreatment in late 2020, the company is being investigated for discrimination. The EEOC or Equal Employment Opportunity came in asking Activision Blizzard employees to fill out a survey. Their investigation is in regard to allegations of gender-based discrimination and sexual harassment. Now, just because they're there doesn't mean there's been a violation of the law, but you know, given their history, I mean, anything could happen really. So 
With that being said, that's where I'm going to end today's episode of The Corporate Casket. I hope you enjoyed it. And if you did, make sure to like, follow, subscribe on whatever platform you are listening to this so that you never miss a new upload from the channel. Thank you so much for making it to another episode of The Corporate Casket, and I'll see you in the next one. Bye.